Fu, welcome to the How Humans Work podcast. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you. Nice to be here. It's great to have you here. Um, I so enjoyed uh, getting to sit at your Dharma talk last fall, and I was inspired to reach out to you. Thank you for accepting the invitation to come on the podcast. I was deeply moved by uh, the Dharma talk that you provided that day about friendship and and the Buddha and and uh, and the Metta Sutra. And I I guess I'll start with the thing that really moved me was what I felt was the presence of your mind and mm -hmm. uh, the intellect and the clarity of your sharing, mm -hmm. your teaching. And, and I felt like I was having an encounter where I'd have had other encounters with Buddhism uh, in, in my life, but I, it felt so clear to me. It was like, ah, Yes, <laughs> I'm really getting this right now. And I had this deep respect for the seriousness of the Zen path and the inquiry, as well as the elegance and the, the kind of the beauty and the subtlety that's all present. So as I've been working my way to like, what are my questions for food today? I found myself really struggling to find questions and so it's kind of like the curtain behind my mind you know <laughs> like okay, behind my mind of the curtain there's all these things going on and I, I could see me tr trying to find a way somehow I was like well that's pretty honest that's real <laughs> you know that's an encounter with my mind and it seemed to me that would be a fine place to start with meeting with you and talking about human nature and the human condition and the encounter with our mind so uh that's my yeah that's my welcome and that's where i'm at yeah well that's where we're all at <laughs> <laughs> you know what's behind the curtain um i love that because as soon as you said that i you know the wizard of oz came to mind <laughs> to mind it's like that big scene where there's this persona you know this giant wizard who's got everyone scared and obeying their wishes and craziness like is going on in our actual so-called real world you know the crazy persona that are overblown like the wizard and then he pulls the dog pulls the curtain aside and there's this guy just turning these knobs you know like you and i are doing right now just turning the wheels and 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 putting this projection and you know, projecting this this we hope people will think oh there that's a person there's somebody you know huh? so uh -huh. this is a very tricky piece of our human uh challenge is authenticity like somehow how do you get the curtain not to go away, but how do you really be in relationship with that tendency we have to present ourselves? You know, my name is Fu. You know, it's like that gets a laugh. So it's not, it's not exactly like um, we want to eliminate anything. But as you were saying, we want to really understand it or live in it, or that's our country. My mind is where I live all the time, and what's showing up there sometimes fools me into thinking it's somewhere else outside or somebody else, you know, rather than just a reaction to sensory input. Like Jeffrey is a reaction to, sens to sensory input. You have color and sound and shape. And so, and then that, that forces out of me a kind of other sense of an other, which isn't true, but we all see it like that. I see it like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Buddha Dharma is really challenging our perceptions. What seems obvious. It's like, look again, you know, what's behind the curtain? I think this is a great place to start. And so you've been practicing looking behind the curtain or the, the Zen practice for many decades now. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious for you, because my my impression of you is that it's helped your mind. It's helped you in your relationship with your mind. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> my God. <laughs> Tell me how. Tell me how, <laughs> Tell me how this tradition and this wisdom tradition is, mm -hmm. is has been an ally for you. Yeah. 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 We, I think that's what we all, we want the secret. Where's the secret to this sauce? You know, there's a secret flavor here that I drew me to Zen. You know, I was, it was mysterious. Even though they were speaking English, the people I heard first, you know, at the Zen Center were speaking language that I mostly know and uh, simple language, 
nothing very fancy. Um, I could hear there was something really deeply, some deep well that was being evoked by how they were talking, which they had been visiting somehow. And I, I want to go there. <laughs> I want to go whatever it means to say deep. You know, there is no deep, but this idea we have of something being deep or in the dark, something I can't get my 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 concepts around, you know, something that's so vast, I sense the vastness. You know, we all I think we all sense the vastness and it scares us. It's like, what what is there? What's the next planet to planet Earth? <laughs> Could we go there and have make friends or something? You know, we're out here in the middle of a nowhere, as far as I can tell, you know, together. We're huddling on this little rock and we don't know what's going on all around us. It's just this vast mystery of blinking lights. And so, you know, we kind of fool ourselves into something called normalcy. Well, I'll just go to the store and get some for food. <laughs> I could do that, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can do these things, mundane relational things, which I've been taught to do since I was very little. Uh, and somehow we know we're on the surface of the whale. You know, we're just riding on the skin uh -huh. and uh, it's it's discomforting. So I think Zen invites us to be uh, kind of scared, you know, to enter into the terror of our, what we fear most, which is death, the end of this, the light. Yeah. You know, so uh, Zen has a lot to say about death or the concept of death anyway. Such as? Such as it's not your business. Yeah. <laughs> you'll never, you'll never know it until that moment when you leap, as Dogen said, into the Yellow River, oh. leaping live into the Yellow River. So that too, the poetry of Zen was sort of like, oh, <laughs> you know, that last moment, each of us has this leap we get to make into the living. Don't know, it's not our business, right? Hmm. So that brings us home back to how are we doing here in this shopping and meeting and talking and acting? How are we responsible for this actual thing that's presented, which is this human life with all of its limitations and confusion and anger? And yeah, you know, let's work there. Let's let's come home. You know, not not God. God was good. I when I was a kid, that was all about God. You know, <laughs> to yeah, have a yeah. Right, heaven. I'm going to go to heaven if I'm a good girl, which was hard. So, you know, <laughs> and then then I started to have some capital D doubt about that whole story, and that never stopped. Although I have a greater affection for the ideas of it, since I have good friends who are Christians and really, really believe it, you know. And I'm like, okay, I love you, and so I'll open my heart to what you what you love. Uh, and then we have to find common language somehow for all of us to be able to talk, not just the Buddhists talk to each other and the Christians talk to each other. Where's the universal language for humans, you know, because that's what we need. And um, yeah, anyway, that was a long, that was a long answer. That's great, though. <laughs> it's good. It's good to get how you feel and how you think and some of the sense of the tools of the tradition. And and this one that I'll just kind of follow a little bit is this thread of, that it's not our business, you know, that the concern of dying, that I, our concern is here and now. And so that's interesting for me uh, to, to think about that, like, hmm, because I kind of, I am curious and I can see the the mind, my mind trying to figure out my relationship to this ev eventual event, you know, in my own life and, and what it might mean and for other people around me. So that is a, a kind of a, feels like a natural concern uh, around living and dying and being an organism and being a being. And one of the things you did say in your talk is that part of the path is to be freed from the duality of birth and death. And so maybe you could put those ideas of why it's not our business and then also being mm -hmm. what Zen or Buddhism has to say or, or, the, or the Buddha has to say around the duality of life and death and being caught in that. Yeah. Well, that, you, that's kind of right. You're getting right to the center point, you know, of where the whole thing pivots. Um, you know, the Buddha was basically help, trying to help us understand the difference between our conceptual understanding of ourselves and reality and our experiential understanding, which is not really understanding at all. 
So what do you say about anything you experience? What do you say about rain? <laughs> you say rain and that's it, but wow, you know, we've had some rain and it's not just rain. <laughs> you know, it's just this it's rain. <laughs> it's rain <laughs> and it's vastness. And same thing with heat and with uh, breathing and everything we look at that's an experiential in this experiential plane invites this vastness sound and odor you know it, it pulls us in to the vastness and to connect it it connects us sound connects me to something mysterious and profound and and vision color and shape and so on uh oh there's a wonderful this is a little digression i hope you don't mind but there was a wonderful article i read about this man who had received his sight after 35 years of being functionally blind and they fixed his eyes and they took the band-aids off and I think the sighted figure like oh now he's going to see but he's just sitting there like staring and they're like are you okay um hello and later on they asked him what happened and he said well I just saw all this color and I don't even know what it was just this massive movement and and, and then I heard this voice say are you okay hello and I thought, oh, this is a face, right? So we learn, we learn how to interpret the swirl and we and the sounds. And we make up these conceptual versions of, of all those things, which in Zen is called fingers pointing at the moon. Language is just a finger pointing at experiential knowing, like the moon. That's not the moon. <laughs> That's the moon is a word. So how to distinguish between our concepts, our words, our language, and our experiences was really the, one of the greatest gifts that the Buddha helped us to enter that question. Not the answer, but go to the question, you know, what's the difference between a word and an experience of what, what it's gesturing toward, like rain or moon, you know? So death is a word. Birth is a word. Complete this moment. Death is a word. Complete this moment. That's what Dogen Zenji, who's the founder of this particular Zen tradition, said. They're, these are words. The actual experience of life is in, inconceivable and ungraspable, as will be, we assume, the experience of the end of life. We can't, we can't really know it until we're there. And, and the most intimacy I've felt with death has been with people who are dying who I, I've spent quite a bit of time, hospice work and friends, and I'm at that age where many friends are beginning to, you know, and their lives are ending. One friend just ended his own life. That was a something very big to think about. So being near people who are dying and watching the transformation from great fear and anxiety and human effort to understand what's happening to a settling, and a real calming, you know, which is kind of what we do in meditation. You know, we kind of calm down, <laughs> calm down. I was looking it's at the okay. translations for what Zen means, and one of them was quietude. Yeah. Is that fair translation? That's fair. Yeah. Jhana, jhana is a, our meditative trances. Jhana is the Sanskrit word. Chan is the, it, uh, the Chinese word. And Zen is the Japanese pronunciation of Chan. So it all goes back to this idea of meditative uh, trance, really, a kind of calming state. Samadhi, these are all words that are very common for Buddhists because we're meditators. So we have a vocabulary of, and Zen is, our Zen is just sitting. I have such so many questions about just sitting, you know, so you're yeah. just sitting. Just sitting. What just are you sitting. doing? I'm just sitting. I'm just sitting. <laughs> I just, I'm just talking to Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're sitting and you're, so this, this feels like to me, a doorway into the practice, or sometimes I think it's called training or Zen training. Mm -hmm. And so I really get, and I really appreciate um, breaking free from language or the, the, the way the mind uses language and gets confused with language or reality or perception. <clears throat> And, and and opening up to what is. And I, I really like your answer, the way about birth and death are just words that are the finger pointing at the moon, mm -hmm. right? So that, that, makes, that makes sense to me. And I, for my own sense of life, um, 
I'm really interested in, I guess it'd be more like direct experience, accepting mm-hmm. biology, being in the vitality, being in the human experience and allowing that to happen, both seeing that I can construct stories around it. And that's always interesting and has value and has limits, but also just the actual, the reality beyond conception of the, this, this life is happening and I am in this life and I can have chatter along the way, but it's not the same thing. So I, I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And so it seems to me part of the Zen sitting, just sitting has so much inside that or so much available inside that. Yeah. And I, I guess I'm inviting you to maybe share some of your own experiences or what the tradition has in the, being the meditators, being the sitters, finding Samadhi, stopping, quieting, and, and what the role of that is in anyone's life and what the role of that has been in your life. Yeah. Great questions. Um, you know, as soon as you're talking now, when, as you're talking, you're stimulating my consciousness, right? And you know that, right? Yeah. So those questions, so-called questions are getting responded to by imagery from my life. And so one of them that came up, the stim- you stimulated was um, what I think of as a rather significant uh, moment of in my path or my journey of seeking for an answer. You know, I give me some answers here. I've got lots of questions, but I really want an answer. Right. So I think that's what dr- drove me on the path of Zen was there was some kind of feeling of a promise that maybe enlightenment means you're going to get some answers. You know, that would be really good. Um, well, anyway, I was I was. Take, I took a group of, of young people uh, back when my daughter was young, a young person, uh, on a trip to Navajo land. And we had been hosting Navajo children and Navajo elders at Green Gulch. And then they invited us to come to Navajo land and they hosted us. And so we spent one evening camping it in Canyon de Chez. For any of you who've been in Canyon de Chez, it is a, one of the places on earth to, to, to go uh, that is spectacular, magical. And we were sleeping there. And so I got in my sleeping bag and, and the goat's bells are ringing and the children are making little noises and all that. And then I thought to myself, this is it. This is the night I'm going to know. Because here I am, Canyon de Chez with the elders, the ancient people, the stars are on my face. It, everything was just right for getting the answer. So I'm, I made that inquiry. I said, "What? what is, where am I? Who am I? What is going on here? That kind of, you know existential demand and I laid there watching the sky for must have been hours because the constellations had shifted (laughs) over to another location and finally probably close to dawn I heard this voice from out of nowhere and I'm making no claims about who that was (laughs) (laughs) no no whatsoever but the voice said it was a male voice probably my dad uh it said (laughs) You will never know. And I was so overjoyed because I kind of knew I would never know, but I had, I need to be told I would never know. And what relief it was to be, just take the journey for the sake of the journey and for the, the joy that I was finding in community and in meditation and in cooking for the community, all the other things I did while I was part of the community for 40 years, I did every job. I've done everything, baked bread, I've weeded, I've (laughs) repaired broken things. I've done all these things like a thousand armed Kuan Yin with each one has a tool. (laughs) You get to do (laughs) a thousand things in your life. And that's what that is, you know, that's a slow motion. (laughs) of your life and just to have that core question settled Mm. i think would i would say for me that was what what of anything came of all that silent sitting or just sitting or just listening just just being Mm. in a place and and being curious um that things come they come from the depths of of your of your being and and all being you know that's what we are that's what I'm from right yeah so anyway that not, that makes that, sense to me that's a beautiful story by the way thank you for sharing that i love i love it i can s- almost see it feel it I love the stars on your face image just the light the moments uh reminds me of sometimes uh being on uh, mount whitney 
young mm. man and, and mm. shooting stars and, and feeling a part of the cosmos. It was, I think I was 19 so with a girlfriend go. and we were with her family and I felt this thing yeah. and yeah. this, this belonging to a thing that, you know, cosmos is the finger pointing at the moon, but it was, it was amazing. Yeah. And uh, what I what I also want to riff on is here is this this sense that if you're never going to know, yeah, it does take a load off, and, and the predictive mind, and it feels like that is um, one of the gifts of sitting. And I'll tie it into a personal story. A couple of weeks ago, I was on the mountain snowboarding, and <clears throat> I have this thing interest in paleo life and ancient human hunter gatherers and human nature and. And so one of the things I've, I've come to realize is like, you know, if you're a hunter gatherer 40,000 years ago, you kind of know who your people are and you know them really well and they know you really well. And you don't have a constant like, oh, here's 50 new people on the street corner. I need to assess and evaluate. So I, I believe that part of the predictive mind is exaggerated by uncertain threats where we're trying to figure out our, our uh, massive changing, highly populated environments all the time. So I'm at the ski slopes and I'm, and I, I catch myself. I'm like, wow, I'm sitting here just kind of checking everybody out to see who they are. Mm. And I really saw, I'm like, oh, okay. So let's just pretend for a minute. What would it be like not to have to read everybody? <laughs> like just mm. take that way down, Jeff, you know, and so I started did and I'm like, well, you know, and if there was a danger, like how long would it take me to assess who I could trust and who I couldn't. And so I practiced that a little bit and it was like, eh, maybe 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. So that means that I don't need to do a bunch of pre-planning of knowing exactly everybody who's in my environment. I can trust my instincts and I can calm down that threat assessment aspect of my mind and I kind of feel like what you're talking about and sitting and, and, and working with the predictive mind is a very similar spirit. Well, that's a wonderful segue to something I just read, because like you, I'm always looking for something to stimulate, stimulating to my my storyboard. I got a long storyboard. <laughs> I've been adding lots of different things to it. I've kind of forgotten much of it. But um, I just read this article from Scientific American that I was like, oh, my God, you know, yeah, and I was yeah. my partner is like, listen to this. Oh, she's going like, that's nice, honey. You know, it's really not not her thing. But Anyway, I'll geek, out with you. I'll geek out with you. Bring it yeah, up. Yeah, 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 yeah. We find each other. Um, so they were talking about neurology and how this, you know, everybody's studying the mind. I know we've studied the mind for thousands of years from the experience of having one. And science is now studying the mind from the experience of an object that they can stick things into and, you know, categorize. So anyway, the scientists were um, coming up with this new idea about evolution that rather than somehow we these things came about because it was a good choice in order to get the coconuts off the tree or whatever it was it was sort of like evolution as a a, a kind of a good a good thing that turned out to be a good thing we didn't know it at the time but as it turned out that was better successful idea than the other ones that were happening so they died out and we went on and that yeah. kind of idea so then this thing is saying actually what has evolved in terms of neurology, because they, they're studying these little things that that respond not with thought, not conceptualizing, but problem solving, like uh, plankton and, and slime mold. And they problem solve what we call intelligence. They're doing to get to the food. So they're going through the maze. You know, They don't have a map. They don't have whatever. But they figure they don't went that way. That didn't work. They go that way. And there it is. So. Uh, what they're saying, this guy was saying, is what what we are is problem solving. We we have evolved as problem solvers. You just talked about solving a problem. There you were on the slopes, you know. Like I'm spending a lot of time worrying about these predators coming at me, but they're just kids on snowboards, and maybe problems I can... that weren't really there. They weren't I'm, really I'm there. I'm one of the kids on the snowboard, by the way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that that we and I feel the intuition of that. I feel like yeah. I'm a problem solver. That's yeah. pretty much what I do, and that that explains me more more clearly to myself than this idea of I got these limbs and all that other stuff through some inconceivable process of of, of cause and effect that, you know, 
anyway, so that I thought was a really wonderful kind of bringing to the present some sense of what what is this thing? What does this thing do? It solves problems. Absolutely. And the best of the brain science that I've seen uh, from Lisa Feldman Barrett in terms of the brain is meant to make predictions and solve problems to, I was just talking with Robert Sapolsky. Do you know who Robert Sapolsky is? I don't, I don't. He's amazing. He wrote a book called Determined and, and I just interviewed him and we were talking about slime molds because he has, there's, I forget the technical name of it, but there is this principle of slime molds can basically figure out the best way from point A to point B through mazes, all based on not because they have a, not because they know they have the intelligence, but because the basic building blocks work in such a way that it creates a higher order without any blueprint in the system. It's, and and uh, it's called emergent complexity. Oh. Yeah. And nice. emergent, emergent complexity means that the small sub parts don't actually have any knowledge, but because of the principles of the smaller parts, they can figure out how to do things that normally would seem like they need a brain. So slime molds, like it, they will, they will make as effective pathways as maybe um, say like people who are plotting subway systems in Japan, like the same level of intelligence of what's the best way from point A to point B or in a, and, and map it out. And, and it's, it's pretty amazing. So that emergent complexity idea is there. And, uh, and I love the science and I love it. And I love the predictive mind. And so Robert Sapolsky, uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, all those folks who talk about the, the nature of the brain, the nature of prediction, the nature of, of, of how things work at a neuroscience level is super interesting. I, I look at that stuff all the time. And like you said, though, Zen is something that's been studying the mind for a long time. Mm-hmm. And his teachings don't come through MRIs or uh, <laughs> functional MRIs and watching that. They come through people who've been sitting and have wrote, written poems and right. written poems and, and told stories and encounters just much like you had in Canyon de Shea. So can we go there a little bit more yeah, in terms of the lineage and the roots of this wise tradition that, that helps people with human nature and, and the, the mind that wants to know and understand its place. Yeah. Well, I think the, you know, I love talking about the th- stuff we were just going off on you know, neurology and all that. You can weave it in. I love it. Yeah. As I said to a friend a long, long time ago, before Zen, uh, I used to go to all these astronomy lectures and go, I can't wait until we get into outer space. And my friend said, Nancy, we are in outer space. <laughs> so I think Zen is a lot like that. You are a living being. You are the example of what you're trying to understand. You know, why don't you try to understand the, the example? You have a really good example of this thing of of life itself. You know, so um, and so there's that. There's the kind of meta, not metaphysical. Zen uh, Buddha was not a metaphysician. He was more of a philosopher and a scientist and uh and but primarily he was a doctor and as he said i i basically teach just two things i teach suffering and the cessation of suffering so you know within all of that delight of scholarship and things we love to learn and all that is which is huge you know there's like my dog died yeah or my grandmother or me you know, there's all of that thing of loss, of impermanence, of wishing things not to be different. I mean, to be different or not different, wishing things not to change. And that very thing, you know, I, I think you're familiar with, or probably many people are, the Four Noble Truths, because we all talk about them so much. But the first one is there is suffering. This is a truth. It's not avoidable. It's a truth. There is suffering. And it can be different levels of it. You know, I, I lost my keys up to um, I have cancer. So we know that there are all these different ways that we suffer. But this cause of suffering, which is the noble truth number two, is basically wanting things to be different than they are. I don't want to lose my keys. And I don't want cancer and so on and so forth. That's not going to help you. What's going to help you is really sitting in the middle of this this truth of now what do I do? Problem solving. Uh-huh. What am I going to do, you know, now that I have this this information? 
How am I going to work with this and find my way to whatever it is that will resolve? So that, that's the second truth. Cessation of suffering, which I think everyone hopes is a one-off. You know, I certainly <laughs> hoped it was a one-off. <laughs> you know, like, Final. For that, Final. Right? <laughs> uh -huh. The sword of Zen, you know. <laughs> um, the cessation of suffering, which is the third truth. Yeah. Is, is the fourth truth, which is the cause of the cessation of suffering. So all four of these are cause and effect relationships. There's suffering, there's a cause of suffering. Yeah. There's cessation of suffering, there's a cause for the, your, the cessation of your suffering. Yeah. And the cause for the cessation of suffering is the way you live your life. Uh -huh. It's a path. It's a choice, set of choices that you make and that you as a being, and Buddha again as a meditator, and all of these meditators over the centuries, were studying the you that you believe you are. Mm -hmm. And finding within that, you know, that I'm I'm not being honest, or I'm, I'm yeah. a thief, or whatever, that all of these um, you know, socially relevant activities that we are all subject to violating, greed, hate, and delusion comes with us at birth. That's where the practice or training that you mentioned comes in. It's like coming to some ethical core belief that if I live an ethical life, it's going to go better for people in my life and for me. So I vow not to kill. I vow not to steal. So we have precepts. At the center of Zen training is this set of precepts, which are just like Boy Scout, Girl Scout uh, you know, the honor code, it's not different. Just don't kill your friends. Don't steal their stuff. Yeah. Don't sexualize them or lie to them or yeah. slander them. Don't be possessive. Don't be angry. It's just so obvious when you hear them. It's like, well, what, what's that all about? Well, that's all about how about doing it? How about engaging in a life that actually is aware of anger and the impact of your anger? And where's it coming from? What's making you angry? You know, is it true? Did that really happen? And while you spend all that time in exploring your anger, your anger dissipates. And then you have some clarity with which to really think about your response. Mm -hmm. So we're trying not to be reactive. Mm -hmm. We're trying to be responsible, responding from self-knowledge. And to reduce harm. I think the one principle of that I think you know, Dalai Lama said that I just quote all the time, my religion is kindness. And kindness comes from kin, family. You know, and we know how hard it is to be kind in our families. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's not easy. Uh -huh. It's a job. And it's something that requires, as my therapist used to say, some extra grace. Some people need some extra grace. <laughs> I thought, yeah, they do. <laughs> because I'm getting really irritated. <laughs> And yeah. I need to offer yeah. more calm yeah. and more self-reflection. Yeah. And uh, so it is medicine. Buddha taught, he was a physician. Great, He's called the great physician. Mm. And I think he really cared about the unnecessary ways that we suffer and cause suffering. So doing no harm is probably the primary, you know, precept. Sure. Do no harm. Yeah. Yeah. And then this idea of awakening, is it any different than what you just said? Like, did you just describe awakening? Or is there something else to it? Well, there's everything to it. I mean, it's it's your relationship with the cosmos that you knew. You knew it. Mm -hmm. You know it. You had that experience. Mm -hmm. And it's true. There's, those are deep truths. Mm -hmm. So that awakening to what is true. I think everyone, I've asked the students in my, my class, my sangha, uh, when did you wake up? I know you did. Mm -hmm. So what was it? What, what was that moment when you were probably a child, when you woke up and you knew something, and which is why you're here in this study, because you know something that you can't articulate. And you have a hunch that maybe it's not so different from what the Buddha knew when he saw the star. And so I feel like we're a little we're kind of like, I was going to say gang, we're kind of an assembly of people who are really so scholastic. I just, gang. I can't go to assemblies. <laughs> yeah, right. But the gang, we can be with our gang. Not exactly that either, but I feel more gang. Yeah. Posse, 
crowd. The posse. There yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Comrades. Comrades. Mm-hmm. That we gather to try and share those things with each other as best we yeah. can. And that's what the monks were doing in the old days. They were sharing. They weren't just sitting by themselves. You know, they were in monasteries. By the time the Buddhism became a, a transmittable uh, form that was about all everyone, not just about the singular monk off in the forest becoming enlightened and who cares. It was about the whole relationship of the community of, of people seeking awakening and sharing their insights with each other. And they, they wrote these amazing things together, which then were passed on through yeah. many centuries of time of what they saw and what they prescribed, like try this, you know, and so we're the inheritors of all of that. And there's a lot of it, unfortunately. <laughs> it's like True. A tonnage. <laughs> but I love the intimacy of that kind of, you know, what would seem like history. Oh, there was monks and nuns and they were practicing and, and to kind of like wake that image up to see the intimacy of their lives. They're dealing with you, the self too, and the experience of it and the, in, in the, the connection and the dialogue and the conversation in relationship to that. It's a really, it's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it makes me feel more connected. It makes me feel more connected. It's like, Oh, it's not just history. It's, it's real lives with the same, with the same inquiry, finding answers in, in a genuine, beautiful way. And so those lives are, have influenced your life. <laughs> exactly. And, which is amazing because, you know, you've spent four decades in this practice. Plus. <laughs> yeah. and some. So, uh, and I, I do have this curiosity about, you know, the mind of Fu when she was Nancy, Trader, <laughs> you know, before and, and, and some of your journey. And one of the questions I thought really intrigued me was, what was the hardest part? Or what was one of the hardest things for you to really get yourself around or get accept or kind of see the value of in the in the tradition that was like, uh, it's just not making sense to me or it was a real struggle? Well, I'm gonna tell you what's in my mind, what came to my mind. Okay. Sex. Yeah. That was the hardest thing as a as a young person coming into my sexual identity. So I was, as as someone said, some great old actress said, I was sane before puberty and I became sane again after menopause. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, bingo. <laughs> so I, I was, you know, I, I entered into this thing that we all do at a certain age and yeah. became very alienated from my body and its wishes to do things that I was going to get in trouble doing. <laughs> it was kind of like, wait a minute, that's, I'm not supposed to do that. I'm not supposed to be here alone with you. I'm not supposed to enjoy this thing that's happening to my body. So my body and my, my sense of my, uh, whatever you want to call it, I don't even know what to call it because I was misguided. <laughs> I wasn't given good guidance by the ethical soldiers of my era. It was like, don't, you know, don't go near it. Don't talk about it. Certainly don't talk about if you're attracted to anything other than your own gender. Don't even think of it. You know, you will go to hell on the spot <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you have anything going on here other than when it's still that mind is still trying to control our culture. This is what's allowed. Yeah. Sacred marriage, you know. Yeah. So that whole thing, I, I think for me as a Buddhist entering into a much more expansive sense of the world, however. The Buddhist tradition is cenobitic. It's basically gatherings of celibate monastics, although we found out that's not true. So thank God. So basically, <laughs> the celibate monastics were just like the rest of us, and we're doing whatever they did to deal with this drive, this sexual yeah, drive good. for sexual intimacy. So that's that's probably one of the key issues. One of the main things I talk to the young people about, I said, They'll come in, they're all ups upset about something. They said, so you're in love with somebody? <laughs> yeah. I, said, I knew. I could tell. <laughs> so we have all kinds of conversations about how to work with that. My heart, I'm sure this is the one. They haven't even spoken yet, right? So there's this whole way in which our imagination 
carries us into some kind of crazy ways of it's a trance and i i yeah. I, I, I really appreciate that sex has to be a trance because you wouldn't do it otherwise you want to do what <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> excuse me <laughs> but you know when you're in the trance there's no other thing <laughs> all you want to do and you know exactly what it is yeah. so i had to work through that throughout yeah, my time as a as a ordaining and taking precepts and having partners and 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 you know desires and i think what really saved me and maybe probably saves a lot of people was adopting a baby yeah because for the first time in my life, there was something, somebody more important to me than me. And that was miraculous. Yeah. And, I, you know, I just remember holding that little thing. She was five pounds, oh. not well, not, you know, she's, she's fine now. She's 30, but, you know, she was really fragile and I wanted more than anything for her to live. And to 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 get through this, she had a terrible disease at birth, and and um, anyway, that's another story. But anyway, so this idea that there's something more than you that you that will help you with your drives, whatever kind yeah. of, or lust or whatever's going on, yeah. uh, something important enough, you know, that it it. It matches this and this and your your sexuality sexuality line up. Mm -hmm. My therapist used to say that you have to have all three. You just have one; that's not going to work. Two, eh, maybe, but three. You really need three if you're going to have a successful, and uh, you know, <clears throat> what I don't know what the adjectives are, but I think we all know what that would be, and we all probably want that one way or another is partner. You know, yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you're talking about sex and that that's uh, part of one of the things that you struggled with. I've struggled with it in my own ways. Um, I think most people like the sexual feelings and the sexual experience and the sexual attraction, um, particularly in, in that adolescent space where it's uh, exceptionally confusing or exceptionally un unknown and, and uh, unguided. I, I was you know, my, mine was more like eighties. So there was a lot of permission and I was, I was mm -hmm. fairly promiscuous as a young man, just seeing where, where those moments of availability were. Um, but, but I, I think that's so real. And I think it's such a, a deep and real part of our humanity. And, you know, like when you first started talking about it, I was like, I don't know if she's actually talking about sex or you were working through as much the cultural, uh, constrictions around it you know it's like it's just like no don't and no conversation where part of my work i think is to look at drives instincts and in, in 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 biology and see their adaptive function or their problem solving roles or their their gifts or their vitality in life you know and it's it and sexual sexuality has so much vitality for it and yet it's complicated and yet it's, there's harm around it. And yet there's confusion around it. And yet it's really a place where a lot of suffering happens among other things, you know? Um, and, and it's just, it just feels really real. And so um, I'm not exactly sure if I'm asking a question or just stay say, saying how that lands for me. Um, but I like that you're talking to young people about it. And I guess I'm a little curious around where now are you with human sexuality and how to hold and celebrate it? And, and that's not just a simple don't like, how have you, how have you found a voice for that generation yeah. after you to be a guide or a support? So you're from the eighties. I'm from the sixties. Yeah. <laughs> we got there first. <laughs> yeah. Like boom, <laughs> uh, yeah. Because that was a that was a, an explosion from the fifties when I was a young person. I was born in forty eight, yeah. so I grew up in the fifties with Donna Reed, and I don't know if you know Donna Reed, but anyway, women had high heels when they came in the house. Their husband came home; they were wearing dresses and high heels. And they were hi, honey, and their hair was done and sprayed. Yeah. You yeah. know that was the image that I was offered uh, for for womanhood and for family life and so on. Um, it was quite a revolution. 
by the time I got to college, I went to San Francisco State, which was a hotbed of revolution in the 60s. And uh, everything was just exciting and new and freeing. And there was birth control. So that was a huge revolutionary thing, too. So I would say we didn't have a, a clue about what to do with all of that freedom. And we kind of blew it. I mean, I can speak for myself, although I think my coming to Zen Center out, out, out of that, out of that confusion and, and, and mass hysteria of freedom uh, really helped me to kind of bring that down into bite-sized chunks that I could then look at them. And I think that's what I offer to the young ones now is like, well, are you friends with this person? Have you become friends? Do you like spending time together? Um, you know, the, this other thing I said, I, I tell them if they haven't already gotten to bed together. I said, why don't you wait on that? You know, that will really change this dynamic. This relationship will change in a way that you may not be able to get it back. You like this person. They like you, you, you spend time. Yeah. If you can, please, it's kind of old fashioned, but give it, we ask for six months from the students, six called the six month guideline. Yeah. And we say, please, uh, please re refrain from uh, having sexual intimacy with anybody here until you've been here for six months. And then certainly not with any of the senior people. And they're the ones responsible for not having, you know, sexual or, or flirtatious relationships with the new students. That is really bad news. That will get you kicked out <laughs> as a teacher or as a senior person. So we have guidelines that are that, because we're living together. And we do see each other and people are beautiful and they are like, oh, my God, you know, so we really have to have a way of talking about it. Yeah. It isn't shaming. It isn't about that's bad. It's more like, well, what are you doing? How are you feeling? How is it going for you? Mm -hmm. Both sides. I can talk to both parties, which is really helpful. So it, it's more like having a conversation, having enough trust and intimacy with the people in your life that you can talk about that yeah you know and i think what what one of the things that you gave me in the talk back in november was this word upright mm. and and i think you're uh, talking about that through the four noble noble truths and understanding there's an ethical line and then understanding you know human sexuality and trying to find that place where we can be upright in ourselves. And there's actually an idea in Chinese medicine called Zeng Qi, and it's all the, the, the cumulative Qi of all the organs and all the functions and the spirits in the body allow us to be upright. And I actually, I stole it for my theme of my practice this year as an acupuncturist of just, you know, it's such a beautiful word actually of, of finding our uprightness and finding our nobility and finding our, our clarity and whether that's our physical health or our sexual health or our mental health or or when it, or sitting and, and, and allowing the, finding the way through the anger, you know? Yeah, so it's... talk a little bit more about the spirit of a Zen of, of, of the, being upright, if you would. Well, it's interesting. You pulled that up because my teacher, whose name is Reb Anderson, Tension Reb Anderson, who was abbot for many years at uh, Zen Center, wrote a book on the precepts called being upright. Mm. And um, we also call our practice uh, upright sitting. So that idea of of having a really intimate relationship with which Im, is an embodiment as you know as an acupuncture you're talking about the body being in balance and when we're sitting it's your body. I'm I'm talking to my body. I'm saying, "Okay, how's my spine doing? How's where's my head? Is it leaning forward or is are my ears over my shoulders? A am I in a nice relationship? Have I got this going here, you know?" And how does that feel? It feels good. And that's the payback. It feels good to be aligned appropriately the way like a two-year-old when they, you know, kids learn to walk, they are upright perfectly. I tell people, you want to see the perfect posture. Look at a child who's just learning to walk. Absolutely perfect. So, and we lose that, you know, as teenagers, you kind of start crunching up and doing crazy things with your body. So we really begin the training of students with posture, you know, we go around while they're sitting and maybe pull their shoulders back and down mm -hmm. and lift, I'll, I'll, grab, I'll take their head and I'll lift it up like that, mm -hmm. you know, and just these gentle suggestions of what is upright look like? What would it look like if you were upright? 
And people have said, that was amazing. You know, that thing you did. And I'm going, what was it? What did I do? (laughs) You know? So I think it's a a help to have trainers, to have people who can look at you and offer critique, not criticism, Mm -hmm. very important distinction, offer critique of what they see about how you're sitting or how you're talking Mm -hmm. or how you're working. And, uh, and then it's of course up to the person to, to take that as a, as a, as a suggestion or as an instruction uh, to themselves. And um, some do and some don't. Like some people aren't ready to be trained. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 You've probably met a few. Uh, A lot. (laughs) Most. Uh Yeah. I definitely have have, uh, probably been untrainable in some ways in my life uh, for sure. Uh, But, the, this idea of, of upright and the critique, I like it. And I want to stay there for a minute because I think there's something and tell me if I'm onto something here around the nature of the mind. When we open ourselves to, I'm seeing you this way right now. And I'm noticing this in you that that is dispelling to maybe some of the trancy qualities that we can get into our subject mm. where we think we're at. And how we think what's going on. And, and it seems to me part of the ability for you to deliver that Dharma talk that I saw was is a is a training of the mind to be objective and clear about truth. Is mm-hmm. a training of the mind to be clear and objective about the experience of my mind. And so I'm 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 gathering that critique has a, a, a important value in terms of helping us see right and see more clearly. Is that how it works? Oh, I, I think it's a really key uh, to the dynamic relationship between not just teacher and student, but peers, among peers as well, and trust. I mean, I think that's the kind of secret ingredient is that we trust each other or not. And I think it comes and goes. Sometimes I trust my teachers, sometimes I don't. So and then I notice that. And then that's another working edge. So I did begin... I always wanted to learn how to draw and I, I, I like to doodle. I always doodled, but they were doodles. <laughs> I could see that. And I wanted to learn how to draw. And I, I took a drawing class. Um, my partner, though I raised my child with, was in a head-on collision on the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, seriously injured and disabled. She's alive still and quite disabled and amazing human being, wonderful human being. Um but why was I saying that? <laughs> what was oh, the you start talking about drawing. Drawing. Oh, yeah. So while she was in the hospital and I had all this time to, to do, I don't know what, you know, I took a drawing class and I had lots of hours to spend, you know, trying to draw. And the teacher, who's wonderful, was a high school teacher, drawing teacher. And so the first thing she did was put all this stuff on a table and she said, no, draw that. So I drew that. And she came and looked at my thing and she, I was embarrassed because I was used to being criticized or getting a bad grade. That's how I was trained. You get graded, you know, that was not an A drawing. I could see that. She said, does that look like that? And I looked over and I said, no. She said, well, why don't you try to make it look like that? (laughs) So you have to look at that. She said, you have to look at that. I said, look at that? Well, I'm yeah, look at it and then draw and then look at it. Draw. Oh my gosh. So that was the key. That was the secret. And she expressed, she taught us about critique. She said, now put it up on the board there. And we're all going to walk along and critique each other's work. And I said, oh no, I'd rather not. <laughs> she said, no, 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 this is part of it. And she said, you know, this is how we help each other. So we put our work up and I had drawn an apple that was floating in the sky. <laughs> and one of the students said, put a little bit of dark color underneath the apple and see what happens. You know, so I did, and it went right down on the ground. <laughs> it's like, <whoop. laughs> so the critique became one of my most valued lessons about drawing to, to have others come and help me come and help me, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I've tried to bring that into Zen center because I think most of us are trained for criticism mm-hmm. to feel criticized or judged by others. And I think that's a total barrier to being able to give people this assist. You know, I want to help. I want to help you. Oh, sure you do. You know, it's like, no, I really do. Will you allow me? 
Yeah. Wow. Will you allow me? Wow. And that's a, you know, I, I studied tea ceremony for many years, which is a beautiful thing to do, partly for mindful. Anyway, I won't go into that. But anyway, my tea teacher would uh, critique every movement because there are 35 movements between the beginning and making the tea. And you can make all kinds of mistakes along the way because they're very intimate, I mean, delicate things. And she I, she just inhale and I know I put it in the wrong place. So I, I was used to working with uh, uh, someone who was critiquing what I was doing. And only, she's Japanese, only once in many years of with her did she say to me at the end of my doing the tea, Fusan, very nice tea today. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say that again? <laughs> uh, but it was so, it was such a great learning. Uh huh. We're in a critiquing relationship with each other. It's not about praise. It's not about grades. It's not about, oh, you're the best T student, you know, because I wasn't and I never will be because there's no such thing. Yeah. You know, it's just, you love what you're doing. I can see that. And can and, we practice together? And can we, we just yeah, practice? Yeah. And there's no finality. Which nope. gets into the back. The one thing I wanted to loop back to um, is this: this the, the the finality of the end of suffering. Oh, I've, I've it's ceased. It's done. Right. And right, right. the idea that the practice is is in in the Buddha's teaching is really a stress a stress response system, working mm -hmm. with deeply evolved mm -hmm. stress responses, which is probably my most impassioned area of interest in my life. And if I was to say it. In short words, I would say something like, I'm trying to re-beatify the, the deep nature of our stress response and the values that they're trying to accomplish, whether their mistakes are on point. So I love, I love this idea that we could find ways of um, working with and training and being in the practice of our stress response or in the practice of not uh, engendering su more suffering than we need to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, a very simple two-step process that Buddhists have been training and practicing forever, which is it's called shamatha vipassana. Shamatha is calm, calming the mind, step one. And step two is vipassana, insight. If your mind isn't calm, all you're seeing is hysteria or bouncing or movement or stress. It's stressful. That's stressful. But when you, you know, like riding on a galloping horse, it's out of control. It's very stressful for us. Get off the horse. <laughs> Get off the horse. Stand there. And now look at the mountains. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're not moving. I thought they were moving. No, that's your mind that's moving. So, you know, all the insight that comes from calming down. So I think that's always been an understanding. That's the thing the Buddha did. He was hysterical about getting old sick and dying he left he ran away from home as though that would help you know <laughs> i'm out of here I can relate i try to run away a few times <laughs> yeah right i'm just gonna leave <laughs> death will never find me <laughs> i won't grow old mm. you know and that was the fantasy is you could find a trance state yeah. that would unify you with 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 the gods oh. while you were alive but all he got was almost dead from not eating. So, you know, he gave that up and, and just sat down and was calm. He calmed, he calmed down. He sat in a meadow. It was a very nice day, I betcha. It wasn't a storm. <laughs> he was in the calm, you know, and I just see him sitting there. Imagine him and having sat many, many times myself of just sitting and calming down, just riding the breath. Like on a little river trip, you know, just up and down, up and down, and then your mind naturally calms. You don't, it doesn't make it calm. It will calm, and when it does, then you can consider the big questions, and you'll find out the answer is you'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. I appreciate your your understanding. Thank you. Uh, I would like to maybe ask a personal question here, which is, you know, at this, uh, this part of your path, um, where the, where the, where the teaching lives, where the energy is for you, 
as you continue on um, on your you know path? What what's what's moving you? What do you what are you still learning about you? The nature of you? What do you uh, drawing um, sustenance from in the traditions, uh, whether that's Buddhism or or cool astronomical sciences or what have you? Yeah, <laughs> it sparkles. <laughs> <laughs> It's a wonderful koan that is a great book by um, John Tarrant called Bring Me the Rhinoceros. And and uh, so koans, Zen koans. He's a wonderful Zen teacher. I met Just him. Cool. Oh, you have you? I oh, have met John, yeah. I could do that someday. Yeah, I, I really liked his book. But one of the koans is Count the Stars, hmm. which I've tried a few times. It's a really good one. <laughs> you get to 20 and you're going like, oh, this is silly. <laughs> So anyway, uh, my future, yeah, counting the stars. Um, I I have plans, mm -hmm. if that counts, because I know they're not going to be what I think. So uh, I have a wonderful partner, and she's incredibly good at uh, organizing plans for things like travel. So we're going to travel now that I'm retiring in another month. Yeah, I know, I know. Thank you. But that's the sparkle of that. I am excited. I'm excited to be, um, you know, out, out of the tube. <laughs> Zen training is likened to putting your snake in a bamboo tube. And I, my snake's been in that tube a long time now, and she's really ready to slide on out. So um, we'll be uh, moving to Healdsburg, where the Zen Center has created a, a, a retirement center. Beautiful place, actually. It's quite wonderful. And and then we're going to settle in and then we're going to travel for two months, which is, I can't even imagine that. I mean, that's beyond my comprehension mm -hmm. of being on the road like I was before I was 29, you know, just going where I want to go with my friend and seeing things and meeting people and, you know, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. And I'm excited about the new home. And when I think of the travel, it has its own, it will reveal itself. When I think about home, then I think about I do have a, a regular Sangha meeting online every week. Every Sunday I do a group every Sunday and I, I, I adore them. And we've been together a long time now and I plan to continue that. And um, I think the people at Enso Village are about 250 people along with the Zen people who are getting old and are knocking on heaven's door. So I think our job in, in being there, I, th I think mine and my the other Zen elders who are going to be there, is going to be to be available and also to be part of that. I mean, I'm on I'm on the same track, you know. So it's like it's not it's not them, it's us living together as our last in our last home. And all of us are moving in there and uh we know that this is going to be our end of life community. So that's a pretty big deal. And I feel the the uh, sobriety of it. Although everyone's sweet, you know, the people are sweet and we we eat tacos for dinner and stuff. Uh, it's going to be very interesting, those yeah. conversations around the table as people are uh, moving further, closer and closer to the end of life. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I was going to say excited. I'm not, it's not, there's no word for what I feel about that. Other than I am going there, and I, uh, I'm glad I'm not by myself. Feels pretty complete. Um, hearing you say all that, I always have more questions. Kind of my job. <laughs> how are you? How are you doing right now? Are you feeling complete with our conversation? Is there more? This delightful conversation. Yeah, so good. You're, you're a good questioner. Thank you. And Good thinker. You, I think many of the perspectives you shared, I'd love to hear more from you as well. You ought to interview yourself. <laughs> <laughs> huh. What do I think, Jeff? Well, here's what oh, I no. <laughs> Well, I am into internal family systems. Oh, good. Cool. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. It's really powerful. Yeah. Um, well, I, I appreciate you a lot. I really, I felt really connected to what you said that day. And when we had the little pre-conversation, I really felt connected to you and I feel really connected to you now. And um, I, I admire a lot that you have given your life or given or taken, maybe received just as much, but, but chosen such a, 
a, a wise tradition and and lived and uh, received from it, and it's very admirable. And it, I see, I see, I see really good. Maybe you probably had these qualities before, but I, I'm I'm assuming Zen definitely helped shine them up in some way. And I just see them, and I feel your your clarity of mind, your wisdom, your your uh your sense of things your uh curiosity uh yeah and your your just a willingness to to share that and it's just it's great to have elders and and people who've walked the path in the world telling their stories and i'm really glad you came on the podcast today well thank you this has been much more than i anticipated in terms of just feeling very heart opening and uh mind opening yeah you know, I think this is the uh, kind of way you and I both want to live is, uh, you know, find, finding those connections. So I feel that way about you, Jeff. Very good connection for me, too. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And what we say in Zen at the end of things is. <laughs> blessings, blessings.